Good afternoon. <laughs> That's a nice response. I like that. Um, okay, just a quick scheduling note. I think you know uh, Secretary arrived uh, last night in New Delhi to participate in this year's U.S.-India Strategic and Commercial uh, Dialogue. This morning he met uh, with uh, Indian National Security Advisor Doval and uh, the Minister of Power, Goyal. Um, he met later with the Minister of External Affairs, Swaraj, and together with Secretary of Commerce, Pritzker, uh, and her Indian counterpart, uh, they chaired the second uh, S and, and CD. Uh, the Secretary's visit to India will continue tomorrow and will include meetings with senior officials and a speech at the Indian Institute of Technology on the U.S.-India relationship and its importance to global peace and prosperity. With that, we'll start. Go ahead, Marshall. Can we start with um, uh, Turkey and Syria? Um, both uh, President Erdogan and uh, the Turkish general, chief of general staff have basically signaled that they're going to continue prosecuting their operations. Um, what uh, success, if any, have you had in um, persuading your YPG allies to uh, vacate those areas and in persuading your Turkish allies from pursuing their operations against the YPG? Well, the first thing I'd say is, is it still remains a, a, a pretty dynamic, uh, fluid environment. Um, that's one. Two, uh, we've seen largely over the last 12 to 18 hours that there has been calm. Um, and, uh, and, of course, that's welcome. Uh, as we said yesterday, we, uh, we, don't, uh, that we don't believe um, tactical operations uh, between uh, members of the SDF and uh, – Turkish forces or Turkish or, or forces supported by Turkey uh, to, to be productive in terms of the fight against uh, Daesh. Um, the third thing that I would say, and I think General Gortel spoke to this over at the Pentagon this morning, that uh, that Kurdish forces have in fact uh, moved to the east of, of the Euphrates. And so, um, what what I, I again I can't speak for. Turkish leaders and what they've said they're going to do or not do, but certainly, uh, and again, General Gotel talked about this this morning, we, we see Turkish operations in that area, and uh, to the degree that those operations are designed to, uh, to secure that stretch of border, as, um, as was always the plan, well, that's helpful. That's constructive. Um, is it your understanding that all Kurdish forces have moved across the river? I'm not an expert on the, the tactical laydown. I would point you to my colleagues at the Pentagon. All I can do is repeat what General Lotel said today, which was that he, he said that uh, Kurdish forces had met their obligation to move to the east of the Euphrates. I, I can't count every nose and, uh, and every pair of ears, but, uh, but I would just point you back to what the Pentagon has said about it. Uh, now, is there any uh, ceasefire between uh, Turkey and YPG? Because a, um, an American official has said there is a ceasefire now, and there is an, an agreement between the two parties. Turkey uh, has denied, and the uh, YPG uh, has confirmed. I, I would point you to uh, both sides to speak to uh, uh, where they are in, in terms of these uh, clashes we've seen over the last couple of days. Uh, as I said in my first answer, uh, we would note that over the last 12 to 18 hours or so, there's been calm. Uh, the, the, there, have by, there have been no clashes uh, between those two sides, and, and that's a, a welcome development. It's one that we uh, strongly encouraged uh, even yesterday. And are you mediating between the two parties? No. To, uh, why not? Do you want them to, to fight? Again, there's been, there's been a period of calm here uh, over the last 12 to 18 hours. That's a welcome thing. We've made clear to both of them. Uh, uh, what our desires are in terms of the focus being on, on Daesh. Uh, but if you're asking me, are we in some sort of negotiating role or mediating role between them, the answer is no. Yeah, the YPG has, has said that they are working through the coalition in order to talk to the Turks. Are they wrong? 
I, again, I'm not. You're asking me for details here on conversations mm. that really are better placed over at the Defense Department. I, I, I can tell you that we. I'm not denying that we have communicated to both sides our desires to see the clashes between them stop, and we welcome the last 12 to 18 hours where that has appeared to be the case, um, and the, we focus uh, all of our efforts on on Dash. It wouldn't surprise me if. Uh, because they're all mem because we're all members of the coalition, because we all should be focused on uh, going after Dash. It wouldn't surprise me that conversations were happening in the context of the coalition. I just can't speak to the, so the details. Do the mediation role, or do you think the two sides should discuss their differences directly? Uh, well, again, so far the so far the clashes have stopped. So, so that's that's the outcome that we wanted to see. We want to see that continue. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's a role for the United States here in terms of mediation. We have made our position quite clear uh, uh, privately and then again publicly yesterday and again today. Um, uh, so we'll see where we'll see where it goes. Well, you're not, not calling that a ceasefire though, just that you're just describing what happened. You're not saying that Well it's like twelve to eighteen hours and we've seen we've seen calm. We've seen um, uh, we've seen the clashes stop between the two sides. And again that's that's the outcome that we want. We want we don't want to see them fighting each other. We want to see everybody in the coalition and we all are uh, focus our efforts uh, on Dash. You can call it what you want, but uh, what I, I can tell you what we what we want to see is a, a focused efforts again against Dash. But you're not aware of an agreement that there would be an, an end to the violence that would last sort of longer than what you've seen. You'd have to talk to you'd have to talk to the, the sides on that. Again, the, the uh, we made clear what uh, what our hopes and expectations were. We welcome the fact that the clashes have have uh, stopped at least over the last day, day and a half, um, and we'd like to see that continue. I think the first news came from a U.S. official confirming that, the, that there is a ceasefire agreement between the two parties. Why don't you want now to... to Who's to the U.S. official? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. So it's That's an anonymous, I'm anonymous I know, source. I, I didn't ask yeah, you. Oh, so we should just... Yeah, so we should just take that all, all, all to the bank. Look, I'm not going to speak for anonymous sources here. Um, and you're asking me, you know, why shouldn't we mediate? Uh, and uh, I, I, there's, since, since the clashes have stopped, um, and that's a good thing, and we want to see that continue, I'm not so sure that there's a need for any kind of mediation by anybody. Um, and that's point one. Point two, we, again, made clear privately uh, to both sides uh, our concerns uh, about these clashes and about the need to refocus on, uh, on Dash. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to have those conversations as necessary. Hopefully, Michelle, they won't be necessary. Hopefully, this can be, you know, th this reduction in the in the tensions here can uh, can be more enduring, and we can all do what we're supposed to do inside the coalition, and that's degrade and defeat Dash. Uh, uh, w one last uh, question for me. Uh, late, uh, latest uh, reports coming from Syria said that ISIS spokesman uh, got killed in Aleppo. Uh, do you have any confirmation? I don't. Thank you. Yeah, on the same subject, uh, mm -hmm. last couple of hours, Turkish press reports that U.S. Ambassador Bass, John Bass, summoned to Turkish uh, Foreign Minister in Ankara for uh, the statements coming out from U.S. officials regarding this truce or ceasefire. Do you have any comment or? I haven't seen reports that he got summoned. So I, I, I just have nothing to say on that. I haven't seen that. One more. Have you been informed or do you have uh, any information regarding Turkey-backed FSA forces, next step for, for them? Do you know whether they are going to go to Westport or you're not coordinated? You have not been informed about their... I think General Votel spoke to the fact that, uh, that uh, Turkish operations along just on the other side of that border, have are continuing in terms of going west. Um, and I think the general said that, and this was something that we'd been long in discussions with the Turks about, that that's a good thing. You know, the, the whole idea here is to secure that border to prevent the flow of foreign fighters uh, across it. It's a, it's a stretch of the border that the Turks have long been concerned about and uh, that we'd been in uh, communication with them about the, those kinds of operations. Um, but if you're asking me where they are today and how far they're moving and where they're going, uh, you'd have to talk to Turkish officials about the movement of their, of their troops. That wouldn't be something that the State Department would speak to one way or the other. Again, I'd point you back to what um, General Votel said this morning at the Pentagon and the way he characterized it.
There are reports that the U.S. has not been informed or not coordinated regarding Turkish incursion into Syria. Uh, would you able to co uh, comment again, whether you that's, again, they were, that's a better question for the <coughs> Defense Department to speak to. I think General Votel also talked about that a little bit today. Um, uh, the, I'll just repeat what I said again yesterday. The, the operations by Turkish forces to secure that border, including some operations on the Syrian side, uh, is something that we had been in discussion with them about um, and supportive of. Um, Yesterday, we were talking specifically about the clashes between Turkish forces or Turkish back forces and members of the Syrian Democratic Forces, Kurdish fighters. And I said yesterday that those were uncoordinated. They weren't being supported by the United States. And uh, in, in terms of notification, there was, uh, there was very little at all. Um, that's, that's different than the purpose of Turkish forces being in Syria at the outset, which was to help secure that border. Okay. Burr. Just to follow up with Michelle saying a U.S. official had talked about a ceasefire, the Colonel John Thomas Central Command spokesman says there's a loose agreement to stop fighting. Is that? Is that the different official than his anonymous official? I don't know. Is that the one you were quoting, Michelle? <laughs> Is that a different no. guy? No, different but you, guy. Said, you said who said it. That's why I'm saying that that's what, what – Well, that's I, again, I, I, I can't I, – I, I, you, you know, th those are comments that are – that are attributed to a military official, and, and, the, and the Pentagon should speak to that. Um, uh, again, call it what you will. Uh, uh, what we're saying is we welcome the fact that there has been uh, calm over the last 12 to 18 hours, and that these clashes have ceased. We want to see that continue. We want to see that endure. Uh, and you could put whatever label you want on it. Uh, what, what we want is a, a, a focus on uh, counter-dash operations by all members of the coalition. Um, and when uh, we had clashes uh, of the sort that we had uh, over the weekend, uh, as I said yesterday, that they were, they were not productive to that effort. They were not helpful. They were not moving us in the direction uh, that we think all, that all members of the coalition need to move, and, and that is to focus military activities against Daesh. Ambassador McClure today. Uh, Ambassador McGurk yes. is on travel in the region. He's in the region? He, he's on travel uh, in the region. That's as uh, much detail as I, I have today. Abby? Uh, different subject. I wanted to ask you about some comments that Secretary Kerry made when he was in Bangladesh. Um, he seemed to suggest that perhaps the media shouldn't be covering terror attacks quite as much as they do. Um, he said perhaps the media would do us all a service if they didn't cover it quite as much. People wouldn't know what's going on. Can you offer any clarification on – Well, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, the, the Secretary's views about uh, the media, press freedom, and certainly the strength and the power of independent uh, press reporting uh, of events around the world are, are well established and well known by all of you. Uh, I think you all know how much he appreciates the work that you do and the importance of the, the light that you can shed on, on so many issues. Uh, what he was referring to in, in that statement was simply that – an acknowledgement of the, of the fact, and it's a fact that all of you know, uh, that often in acts of terrorism there's more than one purpose. Um, there's the, the violence itself and the havoc that it can wreak and the fear that it can instill and the damage that it can cause. Uh, and there's also the notoriety that comes with the press coverage from it, the, the, the glorification of that uh, through um, amplification in the mass media. And I think he was just referring to that as a, as a fact and, and something that we all have to be mindful of as these events, uh, as these events happen. Yeah. The risk of amplifying an attack. Uh, do you know what's happening in Bishkek? Bishkek. Um, I, I can tell you that we're aware of, a, uh, of uh, what appears to have been a vehicle-borne IED uh, that, that exploded there. Um, uh, as I understand it, it was near uh, the Chinese embassy. I don't have all those particulars. Uh, I know it's being investigated by officials there. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, we've been in touch with our embassy, and all U.S. and embassy personnel have been accounted for. Uh, so we're not aware of any uh, injuries at this time. And um, uh, in, now the embassy will be closed tomorrow for Independence Day observances there, but uh, 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 but it's our expectation that they'll be able to to pick up right after that. 
India and Pakistan in India were reporting the uh, oh, uh, Yes, for the Independence Day celebrations. Oh, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, India and Pakistani media is reporting that Pakistani ambassador Jalil Abad Jalani has been reprimanded by White House due to his anti-Indian activities. Sir, by his what activities? Anti-Indian activities, anti-Indian activities. He's, uh, can, I'm sorry, you went really fast, sir. All can right, you just try that one again? <laughs> All right, sir, Indian and Pakistani no, I, media. I, 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 just, let, just let me try it, let me just try it again. It, sir, Indian and Pakistani media is reporting that, uh, that the White House uh, that the Pakistani ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani uh, reprimanded by White House due to his anti-Indian activities. Do you agree with these media reports? I, I haven't seen a report of that. I would refer you to the White House to speak to that. I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Sir, I've just seen a, a Secretary Kerry's statement uh, in India. He just said that uh, Pakistan has, in recent months, uh, uh, taken strong actions against Haqqani network. But if we see Pentagon, uh, they have different views about the Pakistani actions against Haqqani network. Why? State Department and Pentagon are not, are not on the same page. Well, I, I'm not going to just presume that your your uh, implication is correct there, that we're not. I don't know what comments you're talking about from the Pentagon that differ from uh, what we're saying here at the State Department. Look, I just say that, that we all recognize uh, that the continued security threat um, that is posed by the Haqqani network and by other terrorist groups that operate inside Pakistan and along that border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and the Pentagon is obviously well aware of that, uh, as we are here. And it's a conversation that we continue to have and will continue to have with our, with our partners in the region. I'm not aware that there's any dissonance here in terms of the, the way we're seeing it. Is there a particular comment that you're referring to? Yes, sir. So I just, what is I, it? It's a BBC report about uh, and said that John Kerry has said that. No, I know what uh, my secretary said. I mean, you're, you're saying that there, that's a difference opinion that's expressed Pentagon, in the sir, Pentagon. So what's withheld, the Pentagon the Pentagon withheld the, uh, uh, refused to issue the certificate for the military assistance to Pakistan, saying that Pakistan is not doing enough against the Haqqani network. Uh, there is, a, there is a, uh, a constant conversation that we are having uh, with our Pakistani partners about the, the threat posed by Haqqani and by other extremist groups uh, there in the region and certainly operating inside uh, Pakistan. And we make these decisions uh, routinely. And, um, um, and they're based on active, fluid, dynamic conversations that we have with Pakistani leaders. I, I don't know of any difference. I think the United States government is viewing this very much uh, all in the same, in the same light. And um, continue in the region. Continue in the region? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> In his, in his uh, press conference, Secretary also said they recently spoke to uh, Prime Minister Sharif and General Rahil in Pakistan. Do you know when they talked last, what this was about? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see if I have a recent call. I don't have a recent call to read out, so I'd have to find out when the last okay. uh, discussion and, was. And uh, he also announced resumption of trilateral uh, dialogue with uh, India and, and Afghanistan. Uh, why it was stopped in the first instance, he did explain why the reason for res resuming this dialogue, why it was stopped in the first instance, and at what level this will be held next month. I think the <laughs> movement forward, I, you know, I, I think we have to work through those details. And I think what matters is that as the Secretary said, those discussions are important and, and they are going to continue. Um, and he talked about the constructive role that India has played inside Afghanistan and wanting to see that, see that role continue. So we're focused on the future here. I'm not going to get into a debate or discussion about what happened in the past and uh, the degree to which uh, the, the, those, the, those talks didn't, you know, didn't continue. What matters is they are going to continue going forward. And that's why one of the reasons why the Secretary is there in New Delhi today. As I said, I don't have that kind of detail right now. I think okay. that kind of stuff needs to be worked out. Uh, continue on the region. Thanks, sir. Um, as far as the U.S.-India relations are concerned, a lot going on this week. Secretaries of State and Commerce, of course, are in Delhi, and uh, Defense Minister of India is in Washington, where uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, India, uh, they announced yesterday that India is a major uh, defense partner uh, of the United States. So out of these meetings in Delhi, what are we expecting this time more or any other major partnership between U.S. and India is expected? Just like I think there's, a, look, there's already a, a tremendous partnership between the United States uh, and India, which cuts across quite a few sectors. And it's not just 
security and defense related. It's economic, um, trade, um, and uh, information and uh, technology um, uh, sharing. I mean, there's a it's a it's a pretty uh, full and complete and comprehensive relationship, and it's one that we are committed to deepening and strengthening. And I think that's why the, the Secretary of Defense's counterpart is uh, here. It's why the Secretary and the Secretary of Commerce, uh, uh, Pritzker, is there are there in in New Delhi to to continue this strategic and and and, uh, and commercial dialogue. I mean, so uh, uh, if you're asking me, are there you know, major announcements to be had. I'm not aware of any. Um, th these kinds of discussions, and this is where we want to be, right? That we want to be able to have these kinds of bilateral discussions that cut up, that, that really do cut across all the sectors of a bilateral relationship uh, to, to deepen it and, and grow it and to, and to keep it going forward. Any major uh, talks going on about uh, threats in the South China Sea and also any uh, regional t uh, terrorism threats? <sighs> I, I, you mean in the, in the, in the discussions in New Delhi? Well, certainly as part of the S part of it, right? Strategic. I mean, they talked about uh, strategic regional issues. I, I don't have a specific readout on each and every one of these, uh, but uh, discussing uh, 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 tensions in the Asia-Pacific region is something that's not uncommon when we're meeting with our, our Indian counterparts. Um, uh, and there's certainly a lot there um, uh, because – you know, India is – India does have uh, a, a purpose and a presence in, in the Pacific that uh, that's important. And then finally, uh, Secretary's visit to, to Bangladesh, you have anything – any major things uh, were discussed or announced between the two countries because uh, Bangladesh still needs uh, U.S. help in man, uh, many areas, including fighting – I would point you to – I mean, my, my deputy spokesman, Mark Toner, was on the trip and issued a series of uh, readouts from each of the bilateral meetings, and the secretary did a press conference. I'd point you to the transcripts of those readouts and that, and that press conference for the kinds of things that the secretary uh, discussed and advanced while he was in Bangladesh. But, but by and large, and if you look at – again, I don't want to spoil the read for you, but, I mean, they talked about counterterrorism. They talked about climate change. They talked about uh, Bangladesh's – uh, progress on uh, democracy and human rights, and the Secretary uh, certainly uh, m made clear our expectations that that kind of progress would continue and deepen and grow and be better than it is right now. Um, so it was a wide-ranging set of discussions, but again, I encourage you to go uh, look at our website, and you can see uh, all the things that were discussed in Bangladesh. Thanks, sir. Just like that. One at a time. I have a quick follow-up on defense. Thing. Ooh, one at a time. <laughs> follow up on defense. This, uh, Yesterday, China. In fact, today, China has expressed concern about India and U.S. signing a logistic agreement, and they have said that it will not make India safe. Uh, what is your comment on that? On the what? I'm sorry. Yesterday, India and U.S. signed a major logistic agreement, which the two countries uh, were working for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, China has reacted strongly to it. They are saying that uh, they have expressed concern and saying that this will not make India safe. I, I, so a couple of things. I haven't seen the details of this agreement, um, and, I, and I haven't seen a reaction to it by China. So uh, I'm gonna, you, you're going to have to okay. let me get back to you on the uh, okay. specifics about this. Broadly speaking, um, a deepening, stronger, more cooperative uh, bilateral relationship with India is nothing that anybody uh, should fear or worry about. Uh, uh, we both uh, are democracies. We both have uh, incredible opportunities and influence uh, on the global stage. Um, and uh, and a, a, a better relationship between the United States and India is not just good for our two countries, it's not just good for the region, it's good for the world. Barbara, you've been patient. I just um, wondered if you had any comments on the uh, EU decision for Apple to pay Four, 13 billion euros in back taxes. I know the White House and Treasury have made some critical responses. Does the State Department have anything to add? I, I don't have anything to, to add to that today. Um, you have to let me take that question. Uh, I suspect that that's really going to be something more for the Treasury Department to speak to than the State Department. I just don't have anything on it. The Afghan Taliban released a video of a, a kidnapped North American couple, one American, one Canadian. Uh, Caitlin Coleman and uh, uh, Joshua Boyle, they are um, – they're forced to appeal for an end to executions of Taliban prisoners by the Afghan government. Do you have anything you can say on that publicly? Uh, I do. 
We're uh, aware of recent reports that a video featuring U.S. hostage Caitlin Coleman and her husband, Joshua Boyle, has been released. Uh, I would tell you that the video is still being examined for its validity. We remain concerned, obviously, about the welfare of Caitlin and her family, and we continue to urge uh, for their immediate release on humanitarian grounds. We are, uh, we, uh, are regularly engaged uh, with the governments of both Afghanistan and Pakistan at the highest levels to emphasize our commitment to seeing our citizens return safely to their families. And I think, as you know, and I've said many times, the welfare of U.S. citizens overseas remains one of our highest priorities here at the State Department. Uh, we continue to work aggressively to bring all U.S. citizens held hostage overseas home to their families. Okay. Uh, Abby, and then you. Um, Congresswoman Mia Love has sent, uh, I believe, a letter to the State Department regarding uh, Joshua Holt, who is being held in Venezuela. Um, yeah. The, the letter is asking that the State Department put more pressure for the Venezuelan government to release Josh. Do you have any response to that um, or to some of the frustration that's been expressed by the family? Um, well, I'm not, I won't, uh, as I don't, I, uh, we're not going to respond to congressional inquiries or, or correspondence here from the podium. Uh, uh, we'll respond uh, uh, to uh, the congresswoman uh, in the appropriate way. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, a, a couple of things, just broadly speaking, we can uh, confirm that uh, a U.S. citizen, Joshua Holt, was arrested in Venezuela on June 30th of this year on weapons charges. Um, and that he's currently being held in a prison in Caracas. Consular officers from the United States Embassy in Caracas visited Mr. Holt most recently on the 16th of this month uh, and are providing all possible consular assistance. We call on the Venezuelan government to respect due process and human rights and guarantee a fair trial. State Department officials have been in contact with Venezuelan government officials regarding this case. The embassy and the department are, are, are following it closely uh, and again, uh, the embassies visited Mr. Holt on a regular basis and intends to continue to do so as he awaits trial. I believe this trial is September 15th. Will the State Department have any representation there? It, it's typical for us to do that, uh, and I can uh, tell you that certainly would be our desire. Uh, I just don't have anything specific to say, um, uh, you know, to be able to confirm it, but obviously that's, um, that is, it's very common practice for us to be there, to be represented there. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a quick follow on to the Apple question because uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan just add, uh, added a statement saying that the decision is awful and it's also in direct violation of many European countries' treaty obligations. Uh, is that anything that you'd be able to confirm? Does that make it easier for me to then talk to it? No, I, I just look. I just don't have. But if you could look into it, that, that'd be as I said, uh, I'll have to look into it and see. I suspect this is something really for the Treasury Department to speak to. But um, uh, you guys got me unawares here, so I'm just going to have to take the question and we'll get back to you. And then just the, the only other thing I had is that, that the Islamic State's Amak news agency has reported that IS spokesman and external operations manager. Uh, Abu Muhammad al Adnani has been killed. Uh, any confirmation? Nope. In the last 10 minutes, I have no more confirmation than when I answered the question from Michelle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Turkey? <laughs> On Turkey. Turkey! Yes. Shocking. Uh, Go ahead. Today, another 35 journalists. There is a uh, new detainment list about another 35 journalists in Turkey. Yeah. It is now about 150 journalists according to estimates, since we don't know the exact numbers, but this should be around uh, that number. This more than combined of China, Iran, and Egypt. Uh, I was wondering if you have any comment on this. Today. I mean, uh, we've seen those reports, and uh, um, as we've said before, uh, uh, we, and I'd, frankly, what I've said earlier in this briefing, we obviously uh, continue to support uh, independent, uh, free media reporting and uh, and freedom of the press all around the world, including Turkey. And we've and we've talked a lot over the last several months about our concerns about a growing trend um, in the wrong direction with respect to press freedoms and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly uh, in in Turkey. Those concerns remain valid today. And look, we understand there was a. Uh, uh, a, a, um, a very active and uh, um, 
serious coup attempt uh, in, in Turkey, and that uh, the Turkish government has an obligation uh, in looking after its own citizens to also fully investigate this coup attempt and, and, to, uh, and to hold those responsible uh, accountable. Uh, and so, as we've said before, we simply urge Turkish leaders as they as they work through that process, they do, they do it with all due respect for rule of law and for international obligations and human rights. But you cannot imagine about 100 journalists who would be involved with this rule. Is there a justification in your imagination? We're, we're not going to characterize the, uh, uh, every decision they make in, in the process of conducting this investigation, and you're asking me to speculate about who was involved and at what level, and we simply don't have uh, the information to make that kind of an assessment, nor would it be appropriate from this podium. Last week, uh, Vice President Biden, after he left Turkey, I think he was in Latvia, and he was asked about uh, why he withheld criticism regarding crackdown in Turkey, and Mr. Vice President said that uh, since nobody has been tried or executed, uh, uh, there is no need for speak up. When that happens, we can speak up. Uh, I think uh, is this the policy that you are waiting for someone to be executed then the uh, uh, speak up more? Uh, our, 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 uh, our views, our, our, uh, our perspective on these events in, in, in Turkey have not changed. Not one bit. And I think I just articulated them in the answer to your last question. Uh, we understand they have an obligation to investigate. We have, we, we understand and we appreciate they also have an obligation to their own citizens to hold those accountable for this. Uh, this was a potentially, well, it wasn't potentially, it was a violent uh, and, and precarious, dangerous coup attempt. Um, and real people suffered as a result of it. Um, and so they have an obligation to look into this and get to the bottom of it and to try to prevent that kind of thing from happening again. Um, we understand that. And that hasn't changed, and the Vice President wasn't saying anything different than that. Uh, we also, though, uh, uh, urge Turkey, as they work through that process, as I said before, to observe rule of law um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and due process in accordance with their own constitutional principles, um, and to observe international obligations and human rights as they work through that. Um, and we're in close touch with them, and we will remain in close touch with them um, as they continue to work through that process. But there's uh, not a, n no change at all in terms of the, the approach that we've taken here. We condemned it uh, that very evening, uh, the, the coup attempt, that is. Um, and uh, again, we've, we've, we, we, ha we were and we remain in close contact with Turkish so authorities going forward. This kind of a Turkish administration approach to freedom of press in Turkey and jailing these many... I'm, I'm sorry? Would you condemn also jailing these many journalists I, As I said Turkey? before, Michelle... Uh, I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, you guys look so much alike. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to get into the habit of characterizing each and every decision or each and every statement that comes out of Turkey. Statement. No, this it is. is. You're asking me to. You're asking me to months. say whether I'm going to condemn the the jailing of, of journalists. Yes. They are conducting an investigation. I can't. I, I can't begin to to speculate here who was or who wasn't involved in this, um, and that wouldn't be appropriate for us to do that. Uh, they're doing this investigation, and uh, and we understand they have to do that. Uh, we simply have urged them in terms of process uh, how uh, to go about doing that in a way that is that is thorough and complete but also transparent and fair um, and so we're going to stay in close touch with them uh, as they go forward but um, uh, we we haven't yet and I'm not going to begin to uh, to make a judgment here from the State Department podium uh, in Washington about every single decision that they're making as they conduct that investigation. So this is not about single decision. This has been going on for almost two months and, we and have jailing for hundreds we of have, journalists. We have talked about, uh, I, I said it earlier, uh, our concerns about a worrisome trend in Turkey before the coup uh, about uh, limiting press freedom and, and about um, uh, shutting down media outlets or detaining reporters. We've been nothing but honest and open about that. And In fact, I, I said the same thing again today to your first question. 
Um, but if you're asking me to condemn this specific decision, uh, what, what I'm saying is we're not going to get into uh, characterizing each and every move they make as they investigate this. We've talked to them about process and what our hopes and expectations are for that going forward. And we're going to stay in close touch on this. We're, we're watching it as closely as possible. Uh, yeah, Jenny. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, in a Clinton email document, uh, 2012 former President Clinton was planned to visit Kaesong industry in North Korea. That is, the former Secretary Clinton asked him to visit that Kaesong industry. Do you have anything? How that happened? Who invited him? I mean, North side or South side? I, I don't, and I wouldn't speak for invitations or, uh, um, or or decisions that were made by the previous uh, <laughs> Secretary of State. I think you'd have to talk to her staff about that. I don't have any information on that. Yeah. The organization Human Rights Watch is calling on the UN Security Council to impose further sanctions on the government of Syria. Is this something that the State Department supports? Um, so uh, I would just say that we're aware of the reports uh, of that, and um, I'd have to refer you to the UN specifically. And then uh, follow up, how important it is, is it to hold the Assad regime accountable for the use of chemical weapons in Syria? I'm sorry? Uh, a follow up would be, how important is it for uh, the international community to hold the Assad regime accountable for the use of chemical weapons in Syria? Well, again, without speaking to this specific report, sure. obviously, uh, the international community uh, did and I think remains uh, committed to um, to limiting or effectively trying to pressure uh, the Assad regime uh, to stop using uh, chemical materials as weapons. Um, now, as we know, we got most of the material out, uh, and we're grateful for the international partnership. And it really was an international partnership that got that material out. Um, uh, but clearly, we know, and we've seen in this most recent OPCW report that that um, that. Assad continues to barrel bomb his people um, and use chlorine to do it. Um, so I think there's a strong international community mandate to see that end. And that is why, again, not speaking to UN decisions, I think that I'd refer you to them, but, but that is why the Secretary is working so hard uh, uh, inside multilateral fora, not just the United States unilaterally, but inside a multilateral uh, structure to, to bring an end to this war so that, uh, so that the regime can't continue to use chemical materials against their own people. And one of the things that uh, that our two teams, the U.S. and Russian teams, are going to continue to try to work through after Geneva on Friday um, is uh, the, the technical modalities to, uh, to get a cessation of hostilities that is enduring across the nation that would effectively prevent the regime uh, from being able uh, to conduct those kinds of missions. Okay. Any update on, on the meetings between the Russians and the U.S.? I don't have any update today. No. Barbara? Cuba? Um, nine Latin American countries have sent a letter to the administration saying that U.S. policy, it's wet foot, dry foot policy, which guarantees citizenship to Cubans who make it to U.S. soil, is creating an immigration crisis for those countries through which they pass and asked the administration to review that policy. Do you have a response to that? And is there any review likely to be made? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things. So uh, we did receive uh, the letter that you're referring to, uh, signed by nine foreign ministers from Latin America, uh, about what is known as the Cuban Adjustment Act. Um, obviously, we are concerned for the safety of all migrants throughout the region, including migrants seeking to journey northward through South and Central America and Mexico. Irregular migration often involves dangerous journeys that illustrate the inherent risks and uncertainties of involvement with organized crime including human smugglers and traffickers, traffickers, excuse me, in attempts to reach the United States. We continue to encourage all countries to respect the human rights of migrants and asylum seekers uh, and to ensure that they are treated humanely. And we're going to continue to obviously engage in, uh, uh, governments in the region uh, on, on this issue going forward. So we did receive the letter. Um, uh, I'd refer you to the authors uh, of the letter for any more specific uh, information on its content. I have no meetings to announce at this time, um, and the Cuban Adjustment Act remains in place, um, and wet foot, dry foot remains U.S. policy regarding Cuban migration. 
I'll take a couple more. I haven't gotten to you yet. Uh, Russia has announced that President Putin will visit Japan in December. Uh, do you welcome this visit? Do you have any response? Uh, I haven't seen reports of that. I would let the uh, uh, <coughs> officials uh, in Moscow and in Tokyo speak to uh, official travel by, uh, you know, by themselves or by foreign leaders. Um, uh, it obviously, uh, these are sovereign decisions that countries have to make in terms of their bilateral relations. But I, uh, we don't, you, we wouldn't um, have a comment one way or the other. Can you speak a little bit more broadly then on whether you would welcome uh, closening ties between Russia and Japan? I mean, look, those are decisions for the, the people of Russia and the people of Japan uh, to make in terms of bilateral relations. We have bilateral relations with both Russia and obviously we have a very strong bilateral relationship and alliance with Japan uh, that we take very, very seriously. Um, but these are, these, are, these are decisions that these governments have to make um, about, uh, about their bilateral relations. Certainly, uh, the United States um, uh, uh, is we're not concerned or worried about uh, bilateral relations between uh, Russia and Japan, uh, and we leave it, to, leave it to them to define what that relationship is going to be. Context, sorry, just one yeah, more follow-up yeah, sure, on that. Sure. Uh, in the context of the uh, Minsk agreement, uh, U.S. has previously said that uh, you don't want to see a return to business as usual in engaging with Russia. Uh, in the context of that, do you have anything to add? There's, we still have concerns about, uh, uh, quote-unquote, business as usual with respect to Minsk implementation. Now, there's been some progress towards implementation of Minsk, and that's a good thing. Progress by both sides. There needs to be more. The Secretary has spoken to that uh, quite uh, okay. But, um, you know, again, you have to talk to officials in Moscow and Tokyo in terms of this visit. I can't even confirm for you that it's going to happen. I, I don't have any information on it. Uh, they should speak to uh, uh, whether there's going to be a visit and what the agenda is going to be and, uh, and, and what they're going to talk about. That's for them to speak to. Uh, but, not, but nothing's changed about our view that, um, that it's, still not, um, it's still not time for quote-unquote business as usual with Russia across a wide variety of sectors, given the concerns that we still have uh, about um, their actions in Ukraine, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, occupation of Crimea, um, and the tensions that still exist uh, as we try to get Minsk implemented. So Indian uh, the Indian Defense Minister was here uh, in the United States. So did the U.S. side take up the situation of Kashmir with the Indian Defense Minister? Uh, uh, we, the Defense Minister's meetings were at the Pentagon. You should talk to my colleagues at the Defense Department on that. He didn't meet us with here. Thanks. Appreciate it.